Hey guys, today I'll show you a crime thriller TV series named The Glory Season 1. Spoilers ahead, watch out and take care. The drama begins with a woman named Moon, who drove into Simyong City in the dead of night. As she heard the toll charge, she entered onto a seemingly endless highway. This road was so long, it felt as though it had no end. Suddenly, a heavy fog arose. The closer she got to the city, the thicker the fog became. Moon arrived at the rooftop of the Eden Apartments. She walked through the flower beds to the edge of the railing, eating her food, feeling a soft breeze, and thoughtfully gazing at the house across. Moon has been determined to move into this place for a while, although she doesn't really know why. The elderly landlady picked a flower as a sign of welcome. This flower was called the Devil's Horn because it seemed to look arrogantly up at the heavens. As if to emphasize its defiance, this flower only released its fragrance at night. The landlady pointed to another flower, one that bowed its head to the ground to bloom. In a mocking tone, she referred to it as the Angel's Horn. As the landlady explained, she crushed a discarded pot with a stone. Watching the landlady's actions, unpleasant memories flooded Moon's mind. During her student years, Moon had always been bullied by her five schoolmates. She was as sensitive and fragile as that flower pot. Moon despises summer, so she moved before the weather got hotter. Seeing Moon's body covered in scars, it's difficult to imagine what she went through. She has pinned the photos of those who bullied her on the wall. The wall covered in pictures tells the stories of those who wronged her, and she has not forgotten a single moment of the hatred she experienced. The the woman who hurt her most was called Park, a girl from a rich family who has now become a weather broadcast host. The story went back to 2004 when Park got into trouble for bullying a classmate. But since the police chief and Park's mother were middle school friends, the incident was brushed aside without punishment. Afterward, Park's mother even expressed disappointment in Park, saying she couldn't even handle a nobody. Park's mother was superstitious and warned her daughter not to associate with people who have nasal sounds in their names. Park didn't care, though, because her followers, Sun and Choi, were her most useful sidekicks. After that incident, Park started to pay extra attention to the weak Moon. Moon was pushed into the gym by the two. Park approached her, saying she wanted Moon to help test the temperature of her curling iron, then pressed the hot iron onto Moon's arm. Because the gym teacher had been bribed by Choi, the gym became their personal playground. They did whatever they wanted there, and Moon's cries only excited them more. Moon, a child from a poor family with no power or influence, had no one to protect her even when she was bullied. She went to the infirmary to borrow some hydrogen peroxide. The school doctor noticed something was off with her. Rolling up her sleeves, she saw her arm covered with scars. The doctor promised to help Moon, saying they would report the incident. The next moment, Park, who had been lazily sleeping, parted the curtain. She admitted it was her doing. The world, controlled by the powerful, was this cruel. The only school doctor who had ever offered to help Moon was fired by the time Moon visited the infirmary again after being injured. Moon had thought about ending her life. She stood on the edge of the roof, silently blaming the heavens for their injustice, but she didn't have the courage to jump. Her legs gave way and she collapsed on the ground, crying out loud. Snowflakes fell on the wounds on her legs. Maybe she thought the snowflakes could numb her pain. She took off her coat and applied the snow to her wounds, as if snow was a gentle embrace, curling up within it. The next day, Park's bully gang found out that Moon had dropped out of school, because Moon had written their names in the column for the reasons for dropping out and had handed it to the vice principal. Instead, Moon received a call from her homeroom teacher who scolded her for writing about being bullied. Moon stood her ground. When the teacher bragged about his son getting into a top normal university, Moon retorted that he wouldn't mind if his son got hit by his friends then. These words infuriated this hypocritical gentleman. He took off his gold watch and slapped Moon, while several people in the office couldn't stop him. However, Moon's small act of resistance ultimately failed against her own family. Park's mother found Moon's mother and threw her a stack of cash. Seeing the money, Moon's mother quickly signed the reconciliation letter and changed the reason for Moon's dropout to unable to adapt to school life. She even withdrew Moon's university application and disappeared with the compensation money shortly after. Moon looked at the empty rental house and her belongings piled up at the door in a daze. Among these belongings, the book Architectural Space was eye-catching. Clearly, her dream was to become an architect. But now being forced to drop out of school, Moon had to rely on her own and started working from dawn till dusk. From sunny days to rainy days, whenever the weather was cold, the scars on Moon's body would itch and ache. 
Coupled with menstrual pain, she was tortured to the point of being covered in wounds. She went to the river, the water must be freezing. Jumping in, she'd quickly be free from the non-human torture. She thought this was the right thing to do, but ultimately she still didn't have the courage. Her emotions once again collapsed to the extreme. She furiously hit her own wounds, as if blaming herself for being so cowardly. While Moon was living through hell, the ones who bullied her, Park and others were at the other extreme. In addition to Sun and Choi, Park's gang also included two other rich kids, Jay, whose family owns a golf course, and Sarah, whose family runs a church. Sarah's dad is a pastor, and there are many believers who attend their church for worship every week. With Moon's dropout, Park's gang found a new bullying target. One day, while they were causing havoc in the gym, Moon unexpectedly showed up. Unlike before, Moon's eyes this time held a hint of vengeful determination. She walked straight towards Park and her bully gang. Through their internet posts, she found out their dreams. Sarah wanted to be a painter. Jay was set to inherit a golf course. Choi aspired to be a flight attendant. Sun interjected, saying he wanted to be a tycoon. Then it came to Park. Her dream was surprisingly to be a good wife and mother. Even the gang couldn't hold back their laughter. Moon asked Park again if her dream really was to be a good wife and mother. But Park declared she didn't need dreams. What she had was money, which she believed could solve all problems. All she needed was a respectable job. Then, while she was still young and beautiful, she would marry a man of good standing, have one or two children, and lead a life that everyone would envy. After hearing Park's so-called dream, Moon said starting from that day, Park was her dream, and she couldn't help but smile. It was the first time Moon laughed, but her smile was so distorted. Moon's plan for revenge had already begun at that point. Every step she took from then on was to topple those who had hurt her. The scene then shifts to the photos Moon had in her room. They are the five school bullies, Park, Jay, Sarah, Choi, and Sun, as well as the homeroom teacher and her own mother. In 2006, Moon began working at a textile factory. To empower herself, Moon worked hard during the day and studied whenever she had a spare moment. Her efforts paid off. She passed the high school equivalency exam and then began preparing for the university entrance exam. Every night, she studied in the hallway. Her efforts were noticed by a little girl living next door. Whenever she saw Moon studying in the hallway, she would quietly remove her shoes and tiptoe past her. In the fall of 2008, Moon was accepted into a teacher's college. When the neighbor girl heard that Moon was leaving her job the following month, she initiated a conversation with her for the first time. Moon had noticed the warmth that the girl had shown her and thanked her. In 2009, Moon started college. She worked hard to get into this university, which was part of her revenge plan. Fast forward to the present, Moon stood in front of a little girl. The girl liked to see the world upside down. She started a conversation with Moon when she saw shoes similar to her mother's. Moon instantly recognized her as Park's daughter, Saul. Moon noticed the girl couldn't distinguish colors and asked her if she thought people would understand her. The mentioning of the girl's colorblindness here foreshadows future events. Looking at the little girl's innocent eyes, Moon told her about her own story of being bullied and her subsequent determination to succeed. This sounded like a Cinderella fairy tale to Saul, but Moon told her that her mother was the real protagonist of this story. This wasn't a fairy tale, but rather a fable. On the other side of the city, Park was broadcasting the weather on TV, warning of heavy fog for the second day in a row. This fog, arriving in the city with Moon, seemed to herald the advent of a final showdown. Back at home, Moon held the devil's horn, reciting from the Bible. As she looked at the wall full of photos of her enemies, she declared her intention to exact a tooth for a tooth. The light filtered through the pictures into the room, signaling that her plan for revenge had moved into execution. The scene shifts to 2012 when Facebook was in vogue. Moon kept in touch with the neighbor girl, using her account to keep tabs on Park and the bullies. Choi, who had always dreamed of becoming a flight attendant, finally achieved her dream. Choi's family ran a laundry service, and for many years she maintained her friendship with Park and the others, mainly in the hope of marrying well. For instance, she met one of her boyfriends at Park's wedding. However, Park and the others never really took Choi seriously. To warn Choi against revealing their high school secrets, Park and Sarah arranged a meeting with her. Choi chose the most expensive garment from the laundry shop to wear for the occasion, unaware that it belonged to Sarah. 
This was all part of a plan hatched by Park and Sarah. As they mocked Choi, they warned her to keep her mouth shut. In the end, Sarah, annoyed that Choi had ruined her dress, said she could keep it. Humiliated, Choi shed tears, but the next moment she was back to posting selfies and cheering about the gift from her friend. Sarah began her career as a painter, but she was a drug addict. Sun worked for Jay doing menial tasks like walking the dog and sometimes running errands for Sarah. Sun was a pushover in front of Jay who, thanks to his wealth, was at the top of the food chain. Aside from playing golf and preparing to inherit his family's business, Jay ran a boutique. Park and Jay became sex friends with benefits, often getting intimate in the changing room of the shop. But they were just good friends who knew each other well. Park, the weather forecaster, was getting married next month, and it even made the news. The groom was no ordinary man. He was the representative of the famous construction company in the city. Moon later went to Park's wedding ceremony. Everyone was dressed to the nines, forcing smiles, hoping to gain some resources at the wedding. But Moon, dressed as if for a funeral, watched her wedding in the distance, wishing Park a happy marriage in her heart. But she seemed to apologize for not bringing a cash gift, promising to make up for it at her funeral. The neighbor girl is now working at a travel agency. She is aware of Moon's scheme of revenge and often helps her gather information. Now that Instagram has become popular, this group of fashion chasers has also switched to Instagram. Moon sighs at how much she has to learn, but luckily her determination surpasses everything. Her plan is advancing smoothly, step by step. Park's husband is going to be an important piece in Moon's scheme of revenge. Getting close to this man is a necessary step. At that time, Moon found out that Mr. Ha, Park's husband, is a Go enthusiast. It seems Go could be her breakthrough to get close to him. Moon, due to excessive fatigue, faints from hypoglycemia right after finishing her tutoring work. She was sent to the hospital by a good Samaritan. Lying in the bed next to her is a man named Ju, who is actually the son of the director of the hospital and is currently an intern there. Apparently, due to some event, he got injured and was sent here. Moon, upon waking up, is desperate to leave. Ju is impressed by this emotionless, beautiful girl. He even uses the student ID information left by Moon to find her at the teacher's college. He tells her that she forgot to take her prescription and that she needs to take anemia medication for six months due to malnutrition. But a big part of the reason is simply that he wants to see Moon again. Moon doesn't pay much attention to Ju. Coincidentally, this place is a go corner in the park. Ju changes the subject and asks Moon if she also likes to play go. She asks if he knows how to play. The opportunity comes. Ju says he's skilled. If she wants to beat a go master, he must teach her one-on-one. -on -one. So Ju becomes Moon's go tutor. When Moon is not working, she comes to the park to learn go from Ju. Ju says go is a silent battle. While claiming your territory, you also have to plan how to destroy and loot the opponent's territory. This is somewhat similar to the revenge Moon is carrying out. Moon likes it very much. The two have played through all four seasons. Although Moon has never won against Ju, she has already gained enough strength to face amateur enthusiasts. Now it's time for the teacher's exam. Moon says goodbye to Ju as she has to move on to the next step. The teacher's exam is held once a year. After only two attempts, Moon passed the exam in the spring of 2015. She is about to become an elementary school teacher. Another thing that makes Moon happy is that Park is pregnant. Moon might be the person in the world who hopes most for the birth of Park's child. She even goes to the river to toast the child who will be born this autumn. The child will become an important part of Moon's revenge plan. Time flew swiftly, and the year 2021 arrived. Park's daughter, Saul, reached the age to start primary school. It was Park's birthday, and her husband was holding a gift for her in the bathroom, a pair of green high heels. He joked that only his wife could pull off such a bold color, which made Park very happy. The couple was having a great time at home while Moon was out collecting a bag of trash. After piecing together some damaged papers she found in the trash, she discovered a will. The person who made the will was Kim, the director of the city's education group, who had supervisory authority over all the schools in the city. City. Director Kim left part of his inheritance to his old friend. Kim's friend, a person without any blood relation to him, was a new name and the major beneficiary of the enormous inheritance. Moon sensed something unusual. Moon also found a box containing a product similar to Viagra. Why was Moon secretly investigating Director Kim? Fast forward to the first weekend of March 2022. The weather was unpredictable, and Park was currently broadcasting the weather forecast. Because Moon previously mentioned that she watched the weather forecast daily, Ju, who had become a doctor at his own hospital in Seoul, also started to enjoy watching the weather forecast. It gave him a sense of connection over great distances. 
On the other side of the city, Sun was still running errands for Jay. He was at a boutique shop to pick up some clothes when he saw Moon trying on the same pair of green shoes as Park. Sun recognized Moon and started a conversation with her. Moon said that she is now a primary school teacher and she often thought about him over the years. They went into the fitting room together. Sun was trying to show off, but the salesperson's urging exposed him. Of course, Moon already knew what Sun has been up to these years. She deliberately provoked him by saying that Sun was incompetent, which successfully angered him. Moon was straightforward and said that she had learned some news recently. The content was a bit shocking, and she wanted to share it with him. The reason she chose him was because she understood the feeling of wanting to step on those rich kids. To gain Sun's trust, Moon mentioned that when she was bullied as a child, she was most afraid of Sun among the five bullies. This statement piqued Sun's interest, and they agreed to share the explosive news together. Around the same time, Moon received news about the Eden Apartments where she wanted to live. The rooftop of the Eden Apartments directly overlooked the mansion where Park and her husband lived, making it the perfect place to keep an eye on them. Everything was going according to Moon's plan. However, at this crucial juncture, something unexpected happened. Moon went to rummage through Director Kim's trash again, but today the trash bin was empty. Just as she was about to leave, she turned around and saw the maid of Kim's house holding a bag of trash. The maid said that she had noticed Moon a while ago. Although Moon had cleverly avoided the surveillance, she had captured evidence of her actions. Moon couldn't afford to fail at this crucial moment. She pretended to be calm and offered to pay the maid, but the maid made a surprising statement. She didn't want money and wouldn't call the police. The fact that Moon had been persistent in going through the trash for so long showed that she was a patient person. Therefore, the maid wanted to join forces with Moon. She could help Moon, but Moon had to help her too, help her kill her husband. This was a shocking twist. It turned out that the maid and her daughter had been suffering from domestic violence from her husband for years. Since the law couldn't protect the mother and daughter, the maid decided to take extreme measures to protect her daughter. After understanding the situation, Moon decided to collaborate with the maid. Moon hired her under the guise of hiring a nanny. Moon promised to plan a punishment for the maid's husband and also agreed to provide tutoring for the maid's daughter once a week. Starting from then, the maid would become her spy, helping her collect and investigate the information she needed, including tracking Park and others, and Kim, who was her primary surveillance target. Being a spy isn't as easy as it seems. Two basic skills are driving and photography, both of which the maid didn't possess. Of course, these were challenges she had to overcome. Although the maid might seem clumsy, her determination was unwavering. She quickly earned her driving license, and Moon prepared a car for her. She patiently taught her the basics of how to use a camera. From then on, the two would regularly exchange information in the parking lot. The maid's first practice subject was Park. She followed Park to many places. Although her first few photos were out of focus, one could still roughly make out who was in them. Moon came to collect the memory card at night. From the photos, she noticed that Park had taken her daughter to an optician. Moon then went to the optician, which specialized in color blindness. She suddenly remembered back in high school, Jay had a verbal and physical fight with a classmate due to his eyes. Moon, who was not bullied at that time, was just one of the many bystanders. She remembered Jay saying he had color blindness, not total blindness, and that he could see. To appear normal, Jay had been wearing corrective contact lenses for years. Because of that, Moon suspected that Saul was Park and Jay's child. Of course, this was just a guess, and Moon still needed to verify it. At that moment, Park's daughter was trying on her mom's high heels and bag, acting like a grown-up. She said she wanted to be a weather presenter like her mom. Park lovingly watched her daughter. The daughter quietly asked her mom if the shoes were green, then apologized and said they were red. Clearly, the daughter was red-green colorblind. Park was startled for a moment, then comforted her daughter, saying the color of the shoes didn't matter. What mattered was that they were expensive and rare in Korea. Finally, Park told her daughter not to let her father know. Because full-time teachers are not allowed to provide private lessons, Moon met with the maid's daughter on the train every week. The two-hour journey between Seoul and Simyong City was their tutoring time. One day on the train, Moon bumped into that man, Ju. It had been almost 10 years since they last met. They sat together and caught up despite feeling awkward. Ju spoke about a conference in Simyong City he was attending with his professor. The conversation was stilted. Moon had to leave to meet the maid's daughter. As she was leaving, Ju shared that the time he spent teaching Moon to play chess was during his most desolate period. Tutoring Moon was his only regular activity. He had been going through some tough times, and Moon had brought a softness to his life. 
Before they parted, Ju gave Moon his card. Even if there was a slight chance, he hoped she would reach out. Ju was now a doctor at his family's hospital in Seoul. That day, Ju had to leave work early for his father's memorial. The new staff gossiped, wondering if Ju was the son of the previous hospital dean. It turned out that Ju's father, the former dean, had been killed by a patient. Ju was born into a family of doctors. His mother had become the current hospital dean. On his father's memorial day, his mother gave Ju his father's surgical scalpel, an heirloom. Indeed, Ju was a benefactor on Moon's path of revenge. The Go skills she learned from him were starting to pay off. Park's husband, Ha, would visit the Pagoda Go Club every week to play Go, and Moon naturally followed suit. She had been playing there against the regulars for a while, winning several games at $100 a pop, which drew a crowd. It was rare to see a young female Go expert at the club, and this successfully piqued Ha's curiosity. He remembered Moon's last game and was still pondering over it at home. Park's arrival brought him back to reality. In response, Ha answered that there was a person at the club who could have won mid-game, but chose to play until the very last move. Her techniques were pleasing, clean, and decisive, the same reasons why he chose Park as his wife. It seemed that Moon's strategy was working. When Moon went to Eden Apartments to collect her mail, the landlady stopped her. The landlady, noticing that Moon's utilities were barely used, was puzzled. She asked if she didn't live there most of the time, despite her insistence on renting the place. Moon calmly explained that she was still trying to secure a job in Samyong City. On that day, she was there to pick up a memory card, something she was striving for. Moon and the maid had a principle to avoid meeting as much as possible. But that day, the maid got into the car. She had captured a video of an important clue involving Director Kim from the education group, who had maintained an intimate relationship with his own driver, who just so happened to be Kim's friend, the same person mentioned in the will. The information and videos they had previously gathered matched up. They now had something on Director Kim. As Moon seriously analyzed the implications, the maid couldn't help but laugh. Despite being a victim of domestic violence, the maid was an optimistic person. Her laughter was infectious, causing Moon to laugh, a rare occurrence for her. But she was afraid that laughing too much would make her forget her mission, so she usually kept a straight face. The maid assured Moon that she wouldn't drag her down. Before that, Moon had to meet Sun. They agreed to meet on the rooftop of their old high school. Sun knew Moon was out for revenge, but didn't understand why he was excluded. Moon explained that he had nothing to lose while the others had plenty. Sun didn't take kindly to this and warned Moon to watch her words. One false step off this height would mean certain death, something Moon was well aware of since she'd stood there when she was bullied. Moon suddenly asked Sun if he remembered Yoon, the girl bullied by Park and her gang before Moon. There were rumors that she took her life after transferring schools. She fell from this very rooftop, but it wasn't suicide. Moon revealed that she was there that day and had important information. Sun, now interested, asked who the killer was. Moon extended her hand, asking for the thing she wanted. It turned out she wanted strands of Jay's hair from Sun. This was to confirm who Park's daughter's father was. Of course, Moon lied to Sun. The man who had beaten her black and blue years ago, how could she not hate him? On the day of the school opening season, Park and others returned to their former high school. Today, there was an honor alumni award ceremony, and the winner turned out to be Park. Park found it amusing. Park and the rest returned to the familiar gym. Choi chatted with Park and others whilst trying to call Sun, but couldn't get through. Since Choi dreamed of marrying a wealthy man, she had been hiring Sun to investigate the backgrounds of potential rich suitors. This time it seemed that Choi had caught a rich guy. Unbeknownst to her, Sun had become an inside man helping Moon. The sound of high heels echoed in the gym as Moon arrived. Seeing Moon, Park and the rest were clearly stunned. Even Sarah couldn't remember Moon. They had once hurt Moon so much, and now they didn't even remember, mistaking Moon for someone else. But Moon had not forgotten her dream. Over the years, Moon had been watching Park's TV shows, always paying attention to her. Park asked Moon how she had been, and Moon shared that she had changed jobs and was very busy buying new clothes and eating high-end sashimi. Moon had apparently found the director of the city's education group. Moon used the threat of Director Kim's deep secrets and will to request a transfer to a homeroom teacher position in a specific class at Samyong Elementary School. She already had the qualifications to be a teacher and would move to Samyong City. She willingly resigned from her current school. Moon was fully prepared. This kind of transfer was within Director Kim's authority. Thus, the effort that Moon obtained after rummaging through the garbage for half a year with the help of the maid was finally put to use. Moon successfully became the homeroom teacher of Park's daughter, Saul. 
As Moon watched Park receiving her award on the stage, she recalled the days she was bullied in high school. That day, Moon was in the classroom studying late when she was suddenly dragged to the gym by Choi and Sun. Park sat high above, humming a song. Moon had been tortured to the point of being covered in wounds. She crawled towards the door, which was lit up in the shape of a cross. The cross symbolized love and redemption, and at that moment, Moon yearned for someone to help her. Images of the past bullying surfaced before her eyes, but back then, no one was there to help or redeem her. The award ceremony ended quickly, and the students had all left. Moon was the only one left clapping, her applause filled with mockery. Park, unable to contain her anger, slapped Moon. Moon knew that Park had achieved her dream. She had a respectable job, married a well-off man, and was leading what was considered a happy life. The present Moon made Park panic. After all, Park was a public figure, and if Moon were to post under her program saying that she had once been involved in school bullying, it would be a great embarrassment. Before leaving, Moon mockingly suggested that Jay was colorblind because he hadn't seen the colorful world. After that, Moon left the venue satisfied. Park and her gang were taken aback by Moon's return and had a heated discussion in their group chat. These chats revealed the nicknames they had for each other. It was clear that there were close and distant relationships within the group. Park had pet names for Jay and Sarah, but for Choi and Sun, she used their full names. The boundaries were clearly drawn. Suddenly, Park's daughter called to say that the milk had spilled, but that wasn't the point. She continued to say that the homeroom teacher had changed and that it was her mother's good friend, Teacher Moon. Hearing Moon's name, Park was stunned. Upon hearing the name Moon, Park was instantly stupefied, suspecting that this might be her idea of revenge. At that moment, Moon was already starting to teach in the classroom. During her first class, she declared that three things held no power in her classroom, parental authority, occupational status, and wealth. She would not allow her students to bully others just because they wore better clothes, drove better cars, or lived in better houses. Moon was aware of this, but the other teachers in the school wore their biases like badges. They gossiped behind her back, suggesting that Moon must have slept with the principal, but they had underestimated Moon's rise to power. When Park heard that Moon became her daughter's new homeroom teacher, she didn't waste any time. She went to her daughter's elementary school, where Moon was already waiting for her. Park realized that she had fallen into Moon's trap and asked her when she started planning all this. Although the journey was painful, seeing Park's frightened look now, Moon found it amusing. Park, although scared, didn't hold back and threatened Moon to dare touch her daughter. But Moon wasn't afraid of Park's threats. She had made many threats to Director Kim to ensure that no one could use their connections to transfer her. Just then, Choi in the group chat said their high school homeroom teacher had died. Instinctively, Park felt that all of this was related to Moon. Park's intuition was right. The scene then shifts to reveal Moon's revenge on her high school homeroom teacher, who beat her when she threatened to report the bullying incidents in school. The teacher's son had passed the teacher's exam, and the teacher's college that Moon later attended was the same one his son had attended. Moon had deliberately approached him. Over the years, Moon had maintained contact with him, even pretending to have feelings for him. Before moving to Semyong City, they had dinner together. At that time, the son was already married, his father was retired with poor health, and his expenses were high. The son was preparing for the civil service exam in the education department. Moon hypocritically encouraged him and made some suggestive remarks, making him think that she was interested in him. A few days after he passed the preliminary civil service exam, Moon brought a bouquet of lilies pretending to congratulate him. The one who opened the door was the homeroom teacher from years ago. Upon recognizing Moon, he visibly panicked. Just then, his son returned. Moon told him that his father was her old homeroom teacher and smiling, she said she was now a teacher herself. It was a chilling smile. Just as Moon was about to present the flowers to the homeroom teacher, the man intercepted them. It turned out that his father had asthma and couldn't accept flowers especially lilies. Moon, of course, did it on purpose, but she gave the flowers to the sun instead to congratulate him on passing the preliminary exam. Now, all that was left was the interview. Moon said sarcastically that their prestigious education family would have no problem. The homeroom teacher was furious and wanted to hit Moon, but the man stopped his father. Soon after, he learned about what his father had done to Moon years ago. Moon threatened the man that she would report this to the Department of Education. The education system values nepotism, and if she did this, his interview might not go well. She knew he was innocent, but so was she when she was bullied back then. In order to protect his reputation and not affect the final exam, the son made a choice. 
He filled the house with lilies, which triggered his father's asthma and sent his father to the underworld. In this way, Moon got rid of the homeroom teacher through his own son's hand. One day, Moon met with the school doctor of her high school in a coffee shop. The doctor had been the only one who had ever thought to help Moon, even though her efforts ultimately failed. The doctor was aware of Moon's scheme for revenge and still supported her. Moon asked the doctor for a picture of Yoon, the girl also bullied by Park and her gang. She remembered once seeing Yoon, who had been burned at a pharmacy. She felt sorry for her. Yoon was a victim of bullying before Moon, who at the time was just a bystander. Later, she became a victim herself, which is why she decided to become a perpetrator, even though it was a bit late. The doctor encouraged Moon to succeed, promising her support no matter how old she was. It was the first time Moon cried because someone cared about her. Moon then met with Sun at the railway crossing, who had heard about a powerful tool for turning the tables. Sun had put all his hopes on Moon. The day he disappeared during the high school awards ceremony, he had actually gone to steal Sarah's drug trade records. Sun insisted on having a meal while they talked. They went to a restaurant where it was supposed to be a meal with conversation, but in reality, only Sun was eating. Sun handed over to Moon Sarah's drug supply ledger and the background of the rich guy that Choi was trying to hook. Moon also told Sun that she had taken Jay's hair for DNA testing, and the result was a match. Jay had an illegitimate child, and the child was her trump card. Moon then gave Sun a note with a number for a freezer in the Jews family's hospital morgue. She asked Sun to check who was in there. Sun went to the morgue later and saw Yoon's name on the freezer. The duty doctor explained that Yoon was ruled a suicide by the police, but her parents didn't believe it and refused to cremate her. Her parents were missing, so Yoon's body had been left there for over a decade. Sun wanted to see the body, but was denied because he wasn't a direct relative. Regardless, this information was indeed powerful. Next, he just needed to blackmail the killer for money. On the other side, the maid had figured out the schedule of Ha's visits to the chess club. He was there every Friday night. As usual, Ha arrived at the chess club on a Friday night, instinctively looking at the spot where Moon had played chess before. Seeing that no one was there, he was about to leave when Moon appeared nonchalantly. She pretended not to see Ha and walked straight past him to sit at the chessboard, expertly making it seem like a casual encounter. He had eyes only for Moon. As she was preparing for a game, she looked up and their eyes met. Ha naturally started a game with Moon. They had a casual conversation while playing Go and Moon accidentally won. As Moon was about to leave with her winnings, Ha got hooked. He had a million questions about Moon and proposed a rematch for 300 bucks. Moon readily accepted. One of the reasons she liked Go was because it revealed desires in silence, tempting and being tempted in the process. After that game, Moon knew she had achieved her goal. After finishing a game, Moon headed to the convenience store for a meal. By chance, Ha happened to pass by and stopped his car to strike up a conversation. He was intrigued by the mysterious Moon and tried to get more information out of her, but Moon was reluctant to reveal even her name, instead turning his questions back on him. She expressed her love for the feeling of battling in silence and the thrill of destroying an opponent's carefully constructed territory. His interest in Moon was piqued even more. He gave her his business card and invited her to play Go occasionally. Moon suggested he bring more money next time, implicitly accepting his invitation. It seemed that Moon had a good grasp on Ha, but what she didn't know was that all of this was being recorded. By this time, Moon had already moved into Eden Apartments. The landlady would water the plants on the balcony every day. One day, Moon initiated a conversation, asking if the landlady was still a real estate agent and mentioning that she noticed her rent seemed much lower than the market price. She jokingly asked if the apartment was haunted or if it had a troubled history. The landlady laughed and retorted her that she shouldn't ask so many questions if the rent was cheap. Moon, having her own secrets, didn't press further. One day, the maid was tailing Park's mother. As the sun set, the landscape was bathed in a beautiful orange hue. The maid sighed at the damn beautiful scenery, her tone reflecting a touch of resentment. Due to long-term domestic abuse, her life was devoid of light. However, thanks to her partnership with Moon, the maid saw a ray of hope. She felt she had a knack for this spy business. The maid discovered that Park's mother met with a man every two weeks like clockwork, which seemed suspicious. She immediately recognized the man as the former police chief. Moon warned the maid to be careful not to endanger herself, not knowing that the maid had already tracked this man and knew his identity. The maid's dedication to the job was as if she was dealing with her own enemy. The maid suggested they steal Choi's phone. After observing for a period of time, she realized that out of the five bullies, Choi was the easiest to deal with. She was always clutching her phone as if it contained some major secret. 
The last time she tailed Choi, she managed to note down her unlock code, thinking it could be a good lead. No sooner said than done, Choi was flying overseas that day. The maid was already lying in wait at the airport restroom, and she replaced Choi's phone when she was not looking. It must be said that the maid was quite skilled. By the time Choi discovered her phone was switched, she was already overseas and too late to do anything about it. After that, the maid handed the phone over to Moon, along with the unlock code she had obtained earlier. Over at Parks, ever since she learned that Moon had become her daughter's homeroom teacher, she lived in constant fear every day. She called to arrange a meeting with the principal, hoping to find a way to transfer Moon out. But when she learned that Moon was recommended by director Kim, her face drastically changed. She asked to see Moon's resume, hoping to find any flaws, but Moon was flawless with years of preparation. Park came to her daughter's classroom door when Moon was in class. Saul and a girl had started arguing over the color of a flower. Saul couldn't distinguish pink. Moon didn't embarrass Saul, but when she saw Park leaning against the window, she deliberately placed her hand with the scissors on Saul's shoulder. Seeing Park's panic, she was quite satisfied. After class, Park approached Moon, asking her to name her price, as long as Moon never appeared in front of her again at any cost. But Moon's sufferings over the years couldn't be measured in money. Seeing Park's arrogant demeanor with not a hint of remorse in her eyes, Moon was more determined not to forgive her. Apologies were the cheapest thing. Moon wanted to make Park feel the same pain she had. That would be an apology. Moon hinted to Park that she knew about Saul's color blindness. Park's pupils dilated in shock. This was very disadvantageous for her. Seeing Park more and more scared, Moon felt her years of sacrifice weren't in vain. In her desperation, Park went to her husband's company to discuss sending their daughter abroad to study. But Mr. Ha was an extreme rationalist. He questioned Park why she would suddenly want to send her daughter abroad to study. Unable to tell the truth, Park had to change the subject. After hitting a roadblock, Park went to the former police chief. Over the years, he had been promoted to a higher position thanks to Park's mother's influence. Park asked him to secretly investigate Moon. Unprepared Park was now in panic like a headless fly. On the other hand, Moon's actions were proceeding as planned. One day, Jay received an anonymous envelope. Inside was Saul's toothbrush. Obviously, it was hinting at Saul's identity. At the same time, Sarah was praying in her father's church with her eyes closed. Somehow, she suddenly noticed Moon sitting in the corner, staring at her with a murderous gaze. Moon's look made Sarah very uncomfortable. With the help of Sun, Moon obtained evidence of Sarah's drug use. She threw a bag at Sarah, asking her to fill it with U.S. dollars within half a month. Although Sarah was annoyed, Moon had her account book, and there was nothing she could do. She had no choice but to agree. After that, Park, Sarah, and Jay met on the rooftop. Park was anxious about her school bully being exposed to the public. Sarah was angry about being blackmailed for money by Moon, and Jay was suspicious because of the toothbrush issue, constantly asking about Saul. All three were talking at cross purposes. It was clear that although they appeared as a group on the surface, they each harbored their own secrets. Moon drove to the park, where she used to play Go with Ju. Sitting on a bench, she zoned out for a long time. She hadn't been here for several years, but it was still the same as before. There were still old men playing Go. Moon opened her chat app. Inside, there was only one contact. It's Ju. In fact, after they parted ways ten years ago, she hadn't opened the chat app again. It was Ju who seemed to occasionally send her messages. While browsing through the messages Ju had sent her over the years, Moon sent him a picture. At this moment, Ju was lying on his desk listening to the sound of effervescent tablets. He exclaimed as the unread messages from years ago were suddenly replied to. Upon receiving Moon's message, Ju jumped up from his seat in joy. He immediately called Moon, asking to meet and chat their hormones away. The two met at the old Go Park where they used to play. Moon asked Ju about the purpose of the medicine, which was really just an excuse to ask him out and apologize. She was quite rude to him back in the day. Ju sensed her apology was actually a farewell, so he seized the opportunity to confess his feelings and expressed his hope for them to be together. Moon did not evade and told him that what she needed was not a prince, but a headsman who could dance the sword dance with her. The scenes of being bullied in the past flashed before Moon's eyes, but Ju from a rich family would definitely not understand her. What she needed was someone who could fight and seek revenge with her side by side. One day, Moon arranged to meet with Sun at a restaurant. Today, Moon took the initiative to eat. While looking at the tattoo on Sun's neck, she suddenly said that she fell in love with Spanish because of this tattoo. Sun mocked that what he engraved was Latin, which meant, remember you will die. 
Little did he know that back in high school, when Sun used ointment to cover his tattoo, he only left a few letters exposed because he didn't cover it completely. Moon remembered those few letters. The uncovered letters mean, I am dead in Spanish. It turned out that Sun was Moon's next target for revenge. In the restaurant, Sun asked Moon who was the murderer that killed Yoon, because how much money he could get depended on who the murderer was. Moon whispered a name into Sun's ear. Hearing this name, Sun was very satisfied. Since Sun's dream in high school was to become a tycoon, he finally waited for this day. He bought a one-way ticket to Vladivostok and then called Park, Jay, Sarah, Choi, and Ha one by one. The content of each call was different, but it seemed that he wanted to arrange a meeting with these people. On the night Sun was ready to become rich, someone gave him a blow to the head. Sun fell in a pool of blood, just like the half-covered tattoo on his neck wrote, I am dead as shit. Several days have passed since Sun's death, or rather, his disappearance. Jay, who hadn't been home for several days, collapsed on the sofa as soon as he returned. The dog was barking unusually at a spot. Jay went to take a look and his coat closet was a mess. He recalled the call Sun made to him a few days ago, and he realized that Sun was here at that time. Jay, who thought that Saul's toothbrush was sent by Sun, was looking for him everywhere. Park, who usually doesn't respect her mother and worships sorcerers, went to see the sorcerer in an unusual manner that day, hoping the sorcerer could exorcise evil spirits for her. The band-aid on her foot was conspicuous, as if it was covering up her guilty deeds. When she returned to the TV station, Park started searching for any comments about her being a school bully. Seeing none, she breathed a sigh of relief. Park's relationship with her colleagues wasn't great, but her husband was rich. Every time her contract was due for renewal, she would have her husband invest in some advertising so she couldn't be driven away. Later, Park also participated in a radio program. On the radio, she talked about the phenomenon of Polar Day and Polar Night. Park wished every audience's night could be bright like the polar day. Park and Moon, one lives in the perpetual daylight, always bright, and the other lives in the endless darkness of the polar night. After work, Park dressed up meticulously, preparing to attend a dinner party. On Choi's side, she happily caught her man picking out a diamond ring. The man went straight for the largest one, which was bigger than Park's wedding ring. Choi was overjoyed. The man reminded Choi to appease his mother, who was a vegetarian due to her Buddhist beliefs. Choi agreed, but her eyes never left the diamond ring. However, she forgot about her lost phone. Moon found many inappropriate photos inside, as well as many candid photos of Jay. It was clear that Choi thought of Jay as her Mr. Right, certainly more handsome than the men she had hooked up with. Although Choi had tried to get close to Jay in the past, even trying on wedding dresses with him, Jay never took her seriously. These details were perfect for threatening Choi, who wanted to get married to a rich guy and change her fate. Soon, Choi received an anonymous package with photos from her phone. Choi's first reaction was that it was sent by Sun to threaten her. She quickly threw the photos into the trash. She was getting married soon and couldn't afford any mistakes. She asked for Sun's address in the group chat, intending to clear things up with him privately. Choi came to Jay's house that day. Jay couldn't get through to Park, so Choi spitefully suggested that maybe she was with Sun. This comment enraged Jay. Choi quickly prepared to leave, citing a flight the next day. Before leaving, Jay questioned her about Park's daughter, Saul. Choi recalled that Saul was born before the mid-autumn festival, which made Jay realize he might be Saul's father. At this moment, he noticed Choi was wearing the same green high heels as Park. Meanwhile, Sarah couldn't contact Sun, causing a disruption in her drug supply. She was having withdrawal symptoms and could only paint to alleviate her cravings. In a daze, Sarah painted a green shoe, which seemed to imply that Sarah witnessed something murderous, and this pair of shoes is a key clue. Currently, the owners of these green high heels are Park, Choi, and Moon, and the killer might be one of them who wears the green high heels. Over at Moon's side, the maid also noticed that Sun had disappeared. She said Sun sometimes rode a motorcycle and would get lost, but he would always reappear if you kept watch near his home for a few days. However, since the day Sun went to the travel agency, he hasn't been seen at all. Moon seemed to have no idea about Sun's whereabouts, so she advised the maid to keep an eye out while she would confirm with the travel agency. Through the neighbor girl, Moon learned that Sun bought a one-way ticket to Vladivostok. The ticket was dated right after she had told him about the person who killed Yoon. But there was no record of him boarding the flight, and the hotels there had no record of him either. Sun might not have left the country at all. Or perhaps he was planning to extort money and flee, but his life was cut short before he succeeded. Moon concluded that Sun was likely dead. Her reaction suggested she had anticipated this. After all, Sun's life was on her revenge list. Still, if everything had gone according to her bloodless revenge plan, Moon shouldn't have been the one to act. 
How Sun died remains shrouded in mystery. For Moon, Sun's value ended there. Next, she needed to find a real butterfly that could trigger a hurricane. This person was Park's husband, Mr. Ha. However, before that, Moon ran into some trouble herself. The maid suddenly called Moon, saying she was being followed. Moon played a cat and mouse game with the tail, then abruptly slammed the brakes, causing a collision. The two pursuers appeared to be small-time thugs, likely sent by the former police chief. The thugs threatened Moon, demanding that she either go to the police station or settle in cash. Given the circumstances, confronting them head-on wasn't in Moon's best interest. She had no choice but to leave her phone number and wait for them to inform her how to deliver the cash. Because of his last meeting with Moon, Ju made a crazy decision out of love. He decided to go to the ends of the earth, opening a clinic in Samyong City. Without hesitation, Ju quit his hospital job and drove to Samyong City to find houses for residents and his clinic business. An elderly lady from the city's real estate acted as his agent. Ju quickly found and secured a place that he liked. On the same day, Mr. Ha also received an envelope. Inside were Sun's business card and a photo. The photo showed Ha and Moon in the convenience store that day. It turned out that the one who took the photo of Moon and Ha was Moon herself. However, she used Sun's name, hoping that Ha would take this opportunity to learn about Park's friends. Ha was eager to find out who Moon was. Since he couldn't contact Sun, he went to Jay's golf course to inquire. Coincidentally, Jay was there too, and he was suspecting whether Saul was his daughter. When he heard Ha was looking for Sun, he naturally assumed it had something to do with Saul. He confronted Ha, but truly had no idea where Sun was. The two men exchanged business cards, agreeing to inform each other if they found out anything about Sun's whereabouts. Ha noticed that Jay and his wife Park had the same smoking habits and smoked the same brand of cigarettes. He fell into deep thought and gave Jay a meaningful look. Ha's construction company's biggest project this year is to build a Go-themed square. The Go Square has been completed for some time now, and its innovative design has attracted many Go enthusiasts to visit, including Ju. He watches others play Go in the Square, but he is thinking about Moon. Ju messages Moon, who is repairing a car at the time. In his message, he proposes a game of Go, since they have yet to play a full game together. At this point, Moon hears the familiar and jarring sound of sizzling meat. The sound is reminiscent of the time when Park and the bullies used electric rods to burn her. The same scene reappear before her eyes, causing her to fall unconsciously to the ground until a passerby comes to help her up. The irony is that the former bullies have bright futures and have fulfilled their dreams, while Moon, largely because of them, has given up her dream of becoming an architect and has been living in the darkness. Moon knows that unless she defeats them, she will live with this pain for the rest of her life. Moon visits Ju's new home. Ju wants to tell Moon about his move, but seeing Moon covered in gasoline, he holds back. However, this time, Moon tells Ju her entire story, including her desire for revenge. She has poured everything into this revenge. Ju wants to persuade Moon to stop, but when he sees the scars on Moon's arm and hears her question about whether the scars can be repaired, he understands Moon won't give up on her revenge. Seeing Moon covered in scars, Ju finally understands Moon's previous statement about the sword dance executioner. Seeing the one he loves in this state, he agrees to be that executioner and take revenge together with Moon, even if it means embracing the darkness. Sometime later, Ju's plastic surgery clinic is now ready to open for business. He remembers the day when he promised to be the executioner for Moon, who was covered in wounds and agreed to help her dress them. He tells Moon to come to him if she gets injured again and not to worsen her wounds. He knows what it feels like to hit rock bottom and understands her resentment. Ju asks Moon who she learned go to defeat. She answers truthfully that it's Ha, Park's husband, because she hopes that after her revenge, there will be no one left by Park's side. In her view, loneliness and lack of support may be more painful than death and failure. Ju also tells Moon his home's password, 3724. He wants to play a game of Go with her with no time limit, maintaining contact in this way. As long as there's a new move, he'll know she's been there, and that's enough. As long as Moon has a need, no matter what it is, he'll treat it as a sacred task. He is willing to perform the sword dance joyfully. Although Ju has now quit from the family hospital in Seoul, he hasn't changed his address. Some mail still goes to the hospital. Ju's mother, the dean, collects these letters on his behalf. One of the letters from the prison scares her. The sender of the letter is prisoner 3724. It brings back bad memories to her because her husband was killed by the prisoner, a serial killer with a psychological disorder. She opens the envelope with trembling hands. It appears to be an apology letter, but it is full of provocation. She realizes that Ju has been receiving letters 
letters from the prisoner for years. This must have been a significant shock for him. Indeed, Ju has been seeking psychological treatment during these years. He always had a vision of this prisoner, and when alone, he even fantasized and rehearsed many times about killing this enemy who murdered his father. His mind was once filled with nothing but this prisoner, 3724, so much so that even his passwords were set related to him. All this was to ensure he never forgot his hatred for a single moment. Ju met Moon at his most desperate hour. His life is strikingly similar to Moon. Perhaps when he saw her ten years ago, he read a similar story in her eyes. No wonder he said he could understand her after learning the truth and was willing to give his all for her. After this, Moon only asked Ju for one thing. She gave him the resume of the school doctor from back then and hoped Ju would offer her a job. This person was the only one who had been kind to her when she was being bullied. Moon was grateful to her. The school doctor then began to work at Ju's new clinic. One day, Moon visited the church at Sarah's house. Sarah, with a bag of U.S. dollars in cash, came to deliver the goods. Sarah still had no fear of God and reluctantly gave the money to Moon, saying that a wicked woman like Moon can't go to heaven, but she can because she had confessed her sins to Moon. Moon didn't back down. She glanced at the cross and stared into Sarah's eyes, telling her every day she spent on Earth from now on would be like hell. It seems that Moon was preparing for a major move. The money was for the daughter of the maid, and revenge was imminent. Sending the maid's daughter abroad to study was the best way to protect her temporarily. Park heard that her husband was also looking for son, and instinctively asked if he had been threatened. His reaction was exactly like Jay's. Ha felt that something was wrong, and casually dismissed Park before leaving. This reaction made Park uneasy. She checked the car's navigation and saw the golf club and everything went black so her husband had met with Jay privately. Enraged, Park stormed into Jay's house as if it were her own. Jay was not at home and on the phone, he casually told Park he was busy elsewhere and would see her another day. In fact, Jay had already used Saul's toothbrush for a paternity test. Saul really was his daughter. At that moment, he was waiting outside the elementary school for Saul. When Saul finished school, they waved to each other across the street. Saul wanted to cross the road to him. The traffic light in front of her was clearly green, but Saul did not move. Jay instantly understood that Saul was colorblind too. He rushed across the road in three steps and hugged little Saul. At this moment, his fatherly love exploded and he declared that his new life goal was to protect Saul. This protection of Saul, of course, included taking her custody rights. He sought out a familiar lawyer, hoping to reclaim Saul as her biological father. However, because Saul was born within the marriage of Park and Ha, the law recognized Saul as the child of Park and Ha, regardless of her biological father. The lawyer told Jay that if Park and Ha divorced, he might have a chance to fight for custody. This was the greatest possibility for Jay to take Saul. Jay had no impression of Ha. He had asked Choi what kind of person Ha was. According to Choi's understanding, if Jay was the type who was openly bad, Ha was the type who seemed polite on the surface but was wicked behind the scenes. Because of the photo, Choi was also very anxious to find Sun. After getting Sun's home address, he rushed over. Sun's house was a mess, with no place to step, as though it hadn't been cleaned in a long time. Just then, Sarah popped out, giving Choi a shock. Sarah had a bag of powder in her hand and it seemed she was desperate and had to come and search herself. They soon found a ticket to Vladivostok and his passport. It seems that Sun didn't make it onto the plane. Just as they were filled with doubts, the landlady came knocking. She had also been looking for Sun for several days, which confirmed to everyone that Sun was truly missing. The two went up to their usual gathering spot on the rooftop and invited Park over. Upon hearing the news, Park responded that if he's missing, why not report it to the police? Of course, Sarah was reluctant to call the police. After all, her drug use would inevitably be exposed if an investigation were launched. As for Choi, since she thought that it was Sun who had sent her the photo, she was also afraid to report it. Choi cautiously asked the others if Sun had called them before he disappeared, as she had received a strange call from him. Sarah recalled that yes, there was indeed such a call. Sun had mentioned that he was going to send her a gift. Park vaguely mentioned that he often asked her to run errands, but she couldn't recall if he had called that day. Choi, of course, couldn't admit she had been threatened, so she lied and said the call was a love confession. The three women laughed on the surface, but each had their own thoughts when they turned away. Turning back to Moon, she was being tailed by some thugs. She had left the ransom as instructed in the storage box and had the maid secretly trailing these two thugs. One night, Moon and the maid met. The maid had recently been visiting the sorcerer's house where Park's mother went, pretending to be a customer. She had visited a few times but didn't discover any useful information. 
However, this time, following the thugs made some progress. In the motel where the two thugs went, the maid took photos of the former police chief. They were certain that the thugs were sent by the former chief to monitor Moon. The chief himself was working for Park's family, and the thugs were evidently tasked with handling matters that couldn't be resolved legally. Moon inferred that Sun, due to his distrust of her, acted alone and ended up being silenced while trying to blackmail Park. Moon recalled she had told Sun at the restaurant that day that the killer of Yoon was actually Park. Her proof was the name tag of Park. It's revealed that on the day Yoon fell from the building, she was holding this name tag. Since Moon was there when Yoon fell, she got this name tag. Moon originally told Sun to wait until she arranged a meeting with Park, and then she would give him the name tag. The money he could get would all belong to Sun. What Moon wanted was Park's confession, and she knew that she couldn't win against Park legally, so she wanted to expose her deeds to the public. At that time, Sun also agreed to record the whole process, but Moon didn't know why he disappeared afterwards. Now, thinking about it, she believed Sun was most likely killed by the thugs sent by the former police chief. The maid asked Moon what she wanted from Sun. Moon then remembered the incident at the restaurant. Given Moon's meticulous nature and her previous statement that what she wanted from Sun was his life, there was a sense that Moon had blurred the truth to keep the maid in the dark. Possibly Sun's death was also within Moon's calculations, but she probably didn't do it herself. Finally, when the maid asked Moon what to do next, Moon reluctantly suggested they should look for Sun's body. Speaking of Choi, since she had hooked up with a wealthy guy, her top priority was to win over her future mother-in-law. One day, she brought her gynecology test report to the temple to visit her. The future mother-in-law didn't even give Choi a second glance and even asked about her primary bank, claiming she wanted to inspect her accounts. Just as they were discussing, her future mother-in-law's eyes lit up, looking into the distance, and started talking about a teacher. She then left Choi and ran towards this teacher, who was actually Moon. It turns out that Moon, having gained intelligence from Choi, frequently came to this temple to eat vegetarian food and pray in order to get close to and build a good relationship with Choi's future mother-in-law. Choi was dumbstruck at the scene before her. Moon greeted Choi and said that she would make time for a meal with her future mother-in-law next time she was invited. She made casual conversation and then prepared to leave. Choi snapped back to reality and afraid that her past deeds would be exposed, caught up with Moon to talk. Choi stopped Moon and they went to a secluded place. Before Moon could do anything, Choi knelt down. She apologized to Moon, saying her parents ran a laundry shop and had no power. She was forced by Park and she had no choice. Choi said that everyone makes mistakes as they grow up and begged Moon for forgiveness. Moon took a burning piece of firewood from the stove and held it in front of Choi. Choi was so scared that she fell to the ground. What she cared about the most was her job as a flight attendant. She couldn't have scars. Moon showed her how dangerous this is, saying that what Choi and others did to her was intentional harm. Choi pleaded with Moon not to tell her future mother-in-law about what happened in the past. She had even applied for early retirement. If this marriage doesn't happen, she'll have no income at all. Seeing Moon didn't respond, Choi started to get angry. Moon then took out Choi's lost phone. Choi realized that it wasn't Sun who sent her the threat photo, but Moon. There were many secrets in the phone, and now Moon knew Choi inside out. Choi collapsed and said she would be Moon's lackey from now on. The first thing Moon ordered Choi to do was to report Sun's disappearance to the police. Soon after, Jay, as Sun's boss, was the first to receive a call from the police station for investigation. Sarah also received a call from the police. The three met in the studio where Sarah analyzed the situation. She had a drug deal with Sun and definitely dared not call the police. Jay would also be unlikely to report. But Choi admitted it's her who reported it to the police, challenging them if they didn't even care about their missing friend. The two women started fighting. Seeing no useful information, Jay left first. The former bully gang was clearly falling apart. On Friday, Ha and Jay appeared at the back of the classroom of Samyong Elementary School. It was an open class for fathers. Jay, who wanted to fight for the custody of Seoul, began his confrontation. Jay hinted to Ha in jest that he had an illegitimate child, then changed his statement, saying he was here to see an old classmate. This old classmate was the homeroom teacher, Teacher Moon. The moment Ha saw Moon, he was shocked to see Moon was actually here. He couldn't connect all the dots for a while, but his intuition told him that it was not a coincidence. 
After school, Ha and his daughter walked hand in hand to the school gate, and Jay was always lingering in their line of sight. After ensuring Saul was in the car, Ha spoke to Jay again. Jay hinted once more, asking who Saul inherited her wit and humor from. Ha was smart, but he didn't take the bait and prepared to leave. Jay, not having enough fun, asked him if he found the missing son. Actually, from the moment he saw Moon in the class, Ha no longer wanted to find Sun. He had to sort out his thoughts and then confront Moon. After Ha left, Moon came over to meet Jay with a piece of drawing paper. Jay asked Moon whether becoming Saul's homeroom teacher was a coincidence. Moon frankly admitted that it was not a coincidence. Jay suddenly realized that everything Moon had done since the last awards ceremony was planned. In fact, he underestimated Moon. The plan had actually started 18 years ago, from the moment Moon left the gym where she was bullied by the five. Jay warned Moon not to touch Saul. Moon asked him if he had received Saul's toothbrush. Jay then realized that the toothbrush was sent by her. That meant she knew Saul was his biological daughter. Moon warned Jay not to think about helping Park because now only she could help him get his daughter back. Hearing that, Jay changed his attitude. Moon handed the drawing in her hand to Jay as a gift. It was a transparent cherry blossom drawn by Saul earlier. Meanwhile, at Park's house, upon learning that Ha had attended the observation class today, Park was panic-stricken. She asked Saul if her father had talked to Teacher Moon. Saul replied that he had not, as he had been conversing with Uncle Jay. Park's expression abruptly changed. This was more serious than having a conversation with Moon. Park had previously mentioned that Saul's new homeroom teacher was a high school classmate she disliked. Considering Jay's reaction to Moon during the class, Ha inferred that Moon's go game with him was no accidental occurrence. To clear his thoughts, he first approached Choi and asked about Moon and Park's relationship. Upon learning that Park was unaware of their meetings, Choi recounted the bullying incidents from high school, where Park had forced Moon to clean the toilets for her under the excuse of being unable to stand the smell of disinfectant, as the previous helper had dropped out of school. When Moon refused, she was beaten up by Sun. That was the first time Moon was bullied, and eventually, she was forced to drop out of school herself. Choi advised Ha to ask Park about the events, and specified that he must tell Moon that Park was the one who revealed everything. Ha had once asked Moon in a convenience store if she still liked gambling. Moon had responded that she had once bet everything on winning a gamble. Suddenly, Ha realized that Moon was playing a large game. Arriving at the Go Square intending to find Moon, Ha was instead drawn to Ju, who was dressed in luxury brands and playing Go with some elderly men. Upon seeing Ha, Ju greeted him, using the excuse of waiting for Ha to escape the elderly men. Of course, Ha saw through Ju's ruse and knew he was an important piece on Moon's chessboard. The two played a game, during which Ju discerned that Ha liked to control the overall situation. Ju also revealed his purpose for moving to see Myong City, to take revenge for someone. He then gave Ha his business card and invited him to visit his clinic. Ju visited Moon's home and shared his first impression of Ha. Ju asked Moon if Ha had contacted her. Moon had thought that Ha would contact her after the observation class, but he had managed to remain patient and hadn't called even after several days. Ju felt the call was imminent since Ha had frequently checked his phone during their game and mentioned that he had a call to make, but hadn't yet sorted out his thoughts. On the other hand, when Ha returned home, Park was already waiting for him. Ha asked her about her relationship with Moon. Park admitted to a minor misunderstanding in the past, but insisted that it had been resolved. When Ha continued to probe, Park abruptly changed her tone and advised her husband not to involve himself in this matter. All he needed to do was to open that shiny box. Park assured him that nothing would escape from the non-shiny box, subtly admitting her guilt. It remained uncertain whether their decade-long marital relationship could withstand the storms. Recently, Park has been somewhat distracted because of Moon. One day, after finishing her work, her assistant noticed a wound on her foot while handing her shoes. The assistant asked if she wanted to change the bandage. Feeling embarrassed at being caught with a wound, Park made up an excuse that her shoe had rubbed her foot raw. She managed to brush it off with that. Once at home, Park asked her housekeeper for hydrogen peroxide. She was fervently cleaning a pair of green shoes, almost as if she was trying to hide some crime, which remains unknown. The wound on her foot was glaringly apparent. At this point, the former police chief called and arranged to meet the next day at noon. A conspicuous bag sat on the sofa. It belonged to one of the girls who had been followed by the maid and had visited the sorcerer. It seemed like this sorcerer was running a business introducing girls. According to the former chief's information, Moon was completely clean. She had not committed any illegal acts, making it difficult to find anything to hold against her. Park thought about approaching Moon's mother. 
In her view, the families of poor children were the biggest offenders. In fact, two thugs had already found Moon's mother, but she hadn't had contact with Moon for a long time and couldn't provide any useful information. Moreover, her mental state seemed unstable. Meanwhile, Moon was discussing her mother with Ju. On Moon's wall of revenge, the only person Ju couldn't identify was a woman in a red apron. Moon didn't hide, telling him that the woman was her own mother. Upon hearing this, Ju felt it was a heavy topic and didn't probe further. Moon then asked Ju about his house's password. Most people's passwords are special numbers like birthdays or license plate numbers, but Ju's house password didn't seem to be. This question led to an even heavier topic, which Ju avoided. In fact, the number 3724 had been mentioned several times previously. That was the prisoner number of the murderer who killed Ju's father. One day, Ju's mother went to the prison to pick up the said prisoner, who apologized to her with a serious expression, but Ju's mother didn't fall for it. She warned him to stay away from her son. When the murderer saw that Ju's mother was not buying his act, he quickly showed his true colors. He had no intention of leaving prison at all. He was living well there, with free food and drink. The only downside was the boredom, so over the years, he had been sending the same letter to Ju over and over again, hoping to see him mentally collapse and fall into the abyss. Moon's revenge scheme is fast approaching its final stage. She met with the maid, carrying a large bag of money. It was meant for the maid's daughter's overseas studies. Moon indicated that she was gradually advancing her plan. Once the maid's daughter left for overseas, the part of the plan involving the maid's husband would commence. The daughter would hear news of her father's passing while in the United States. Moon also apologized to the maid because she had promised to help her fulfill her dream. The maid's dream was merely to have a meal with her daughter, but now she must lose her daughter. Later that day, Ha called his housekeeper to cancel his weekend plans, saying he had personal matters to attend to and to keep Monday and Tuesday free. He finally arranged a meeting with Moon. The two met at the Go Square. Moon knew he had many questions, but contrary to his usual demeanor, Ha wanted to hear what Moon had to say. He had already formed his own understanding of the situation, but needed to hear Moon's perspective again. Learning that Moon approached him because of Park, Ha was filled with disappointment. He asked Moon if she learned Go intentionally. Moon admitted she did at first, but later fell in love with Go because it was like building a house. Her childhood dream was to become an architect, but she had given up. Ha also asked where Moon lived. If she intentionally approached them, she should live nearby. Indeed, she lived just next door to him. At this time, Park had also found Moon's address, Eden Apartment 301. Park confirmed the address was right in front of her mansion. She had someone break open Moon's door and entered her room. Seeing the photos all over the wall, Park was shocked beyond belief. Evidently, she hadn't expected Moon to have planned for so long. She lit a cigarette and pondered why she didn't kill Moon back then. Park's eyes were full of contempt. After planning for so long, Moon was still exposed by her. Just then, the door of room 301 was opened again. Park thought it was Moon returning and was ready to give her a surprise, but she was shocked once again. The person who entered was her husband, Ha. It turned out that when Ha asked where Moon lived earlier, she had given him her address to see for himself. Possibly, she might have even anticipated Park's arrival. At this moment, Moon was sitting in Ju's house. She made a move in the game of Go, playing with black pieces, intending to control the whole game. As for Ju, he went to the morgue of his family hospital. He opened Yoon's freezer, but it was empty. The secret behind its disappearance would be solved in season two of this drama. This is Daniel CC Movie Channel. Stay safe and enjoy your day.